Welcome back to the Unabated Podcast. I'm Gina Fiore. This week, Tom and Jack sit down with Matt Friedman from Fantasy Life. They discuss NFL Week 3, how injuries are impacting the outlook for some teams, and how that affects your handicapping going forward. Jack also reveals why unabated t-shirts are so soft. Please enjoy this episode with Matt Friedman. Here's Tom and Jack. Unabated! That's a new word, unabated! Hello, everyone, and welcome on into the Unabated Podcast. I'm Thomas Viola, and joining me, as always, Mr. Unabated himself, Captain Jack Andrews. Jack, it's an exciting show today. We've got Matt Friedman from Fantasy Life coming on. We're going to be talking about what his thoughts on some teams, some of the massive injury news that we've seen, and so much more. But here with you, I want to get started, and I want to talk about the bloodbath we have seen in Circa Survivor the past two weeks here. It is the first two weeks of the season, and week one, we see the top-selected team in Cincinnati go out. Week two, we see the Ravens get upset by the Raiders. That takes another top team out, and we had a whole bunch of other upsets. Uh, of the top five, I think only one, t- uh, only the number two chosen team uh, survived. So we are down almost already half the field here. But this does bring up some conversations about changes in strategy and things that you're going to see given the makeup of the field now what's your take on the survivor landscape right now and where are you looking if you're a survivor contestant well i think a lot of the discussion lately has been that okay with the top rated team or the top uh, rated team based on the spread that week has gone out two weeks in a row so therefore a lot of the square money must be gone out of the market and there must be just more sharp money left in the contest that's That's not really true because a lot of the key benefit of being contrarian or at least uh, not taking the top picks, a lot of the value of that, that the the plus EV comes later in the contest. In the first couple of weeks, it has value, but it has less value than it has later in the contest. So don't think that necessarily you've shaken the tree and all the square money has already fallen off the tree. Uh, there's there's still a lot of square money in there. And I think while it's a great idea to try to pick from not the top two to three choices each week, uh, just be cognizant that the real benefit of that is like later in a, in a contest when maybe you're down to 30 people and you know that 20 of them might be uh, having the same team left. That's when stuff like that really takes... Uh, value. So um, just continue doing what you're doing. If you're still in something like Circus Survivor, where there is, uh, let's see, I think we have like 9,000 people left there. It's still a huge field. If you're in a smaller Survivor it's, contest, we're like maybe... four to five now. Have we lost that many? Oh, yeah, I guess, I guess you're right. We have lost. Yeah. So it's this about 30% great. of the field is left or something like that, right? Yeah, it's crazy. Uh, but if you're in a smaller contest where maybe you're down to the final, 30, 40 people. Everyone still has a lot of teams remaining. So it's tough to pinpoint where the majority of the market's going to be going with their pick. So you don't have to like get too far. You don't have to make it make it be too much of a um, you know, contrarian play just yet. That's a very good point to be uh, thinking about here, especially for anyone who's listening who is still in the circuit survivor contest. And by the way, any survivor contest you're still in. Check out the uh, NFL Survivor Optimizer that we have for you over at Unabated. Uh, it should be able to help you quite a bit. I know it's helped me through two weeks here, and it certainly helped some people last year. We had some great success with it, so be sure to check that out. But right now, Jack, I think we should bring on Matt, and we should start checking out some of these teams for Week 3 in the NFL. What do you think? Yeah, let's do it. And ladies and gentlemen, welcome on into the show, Matt F. The Oracle. Because I know how much you hate it, Matt. Matt Friedman from Fantasy Life. Thank you so much for being here with us today. It's great to have you back on a show, Matt. How you doing? Uh, I'm doing well, Tom. It's always good to to talk to you and, and Jack. And uh, it was really nice seeing you guys in Vegas for Bet Bash. Uh, I thought the the event that you guys had, where it was you know just for the subscribers, and you guys had the trivia contest. I thought that was a lot of fun. Uh, so it was great seeing you guys in person, and obviously great catching up here now. Oh, hey, well, it was great having you out there. I think we've had, what, uh, four different people that attended that event come on the pod by this point. So if you're uh, if you're wondering how you get on the show, that's pretty much uh, that's pretty much the answer at this point. Also, for the audio listeners here, very much uh, an upset on the ticket that you'd be wearing a Cowboys hat and I would not be wearing a Jets jersey. Uh, 
that that you had if you had to parlay the other way, that was the chalk there. Massive upset coming in here. Yeah, absolutely. And speaking of, of clothing, the the shirt that you guys gave away at that event, one of the best shirts I've seen in the industry. In fact, I liked it so much that I I wore it. I mean, granted, it was underneath another shirt, but I still wore it on a, a date that I went on a couple of weeks ago. So you guys really representing there. Wow. Well, let, let me just say that I take a lot of pride in when we create shirts that we hand out to uh, these member meetups each year. I take a lot of pride in high quality cotton polyester blend. Uh, you don't just choose like the cheapest gilded jersey shirt, whatever. You, you go yeah. deep into the menu and you find the high quality blend. So thank you, Matt. That is the best compliment I've received so far this season. <laughs> I'm, I'm happy to give it. It was a great shirt. And you were right. It's the quality. It's the the texture of the material itself that is part of why it is such a great shirt. But the design, the I mean, it was great too. I, I can't stress enough how much that really does. Like that, all of that coming from Jack is a thousand percent genuine because he absolutely loves the fact that he's the guy who caught up with the, with the design. Yeah. And he's always the one who's right there with the quality of the shirts too. And because we've spent so much time talking about at this point, um, if you are listening and you go and you give us a five-star rating on the podcast, um, screenshot it to me, send it to me either on discord TV at work, email at Tom V at unabated. I don't care. Um, first one to do so I'll send you one out. If you give me your address and are not located outside of the U S so if you're in Canada, unfortunately, I'm sorry, we're just not going through the hassle anymore with it. It's tough shipping stuff up to you guys, but yeah, go get yourself a free shirt just by, uh, sending us that sending us a screenshot of your rating of the show. I'll pick someone. Um, and in the meantime, Let's get into some football here because we're recording this again on a Monday here. Show's going to come out on Wednesday, but oh man, we already have so much injury news here. It feels like it has not been this bad through week two in forever, Matt. And I can say as someone with Kenneth Walker, Puka Nakua, and Cooper Cup all on the same field. Oh, and Debo, who's now added to the injury report as of 20 minutes before we started recording this show. Um, everyone's out at this point and things are a disaster. Yeah, um, maximal pain as we are recording this, right? You said it's a Monday. So I've already started writing my fantasy article for this upcoming week. And there are just so many players who are injured that I just like, I had to put a disclaimer at the top of the article being like, look, I, you know, I'm writing this. I don't know what's going to happen with some of these players. You know, we'll know more by the time it gets to kick off. Look at my rankings and projections for, you know, up to the date, uh, you know, uh, I guess representation of what I'm thinking now about these players. But yeah, it was... It was really unfortunate the number of players who got injured this past week. And then, of course, like that, that makes for an uncertain market for week three with what lies ahead. Exactly. And that's something that we talked about a lot last week with overreaction Monday from week one to week two and how the market is waiting some of these guys. So we're going to get into some of that because, again, shout out to Jack. Spot on last week with the market overweighting the Jordan Love to Malik Willis move there. Um, we still have some of that coming up this week. Green Bay is going to be a team that we talk about. But before we get into some of these specific teams and market moves, I have to ask you a more global question. We talked about it a little bit at the end of last week's show, and I was like, we're having Matt on next week. I want his thoughts. We've seen a massive drop through two weeks here in passing stats this year. I think we've had something like 66 touched passing touchdowns thrown as opposed to well over 100 through most of the last several seasons. Is it quarterback play? Is it offense is being more conservative? Is it the fact that every team and their mother is playing a too high safety now and we're going to have to see teams ad adapt? What is going on around the league? And do you think it's going to regress as the season goes on? Yeah, it's it's a really good question. And, and the answer is like, I don't know, and probably some combination of all of the above. But you have more uh, defensive-minded head coaches now than we had maybe like five, 10 years ago. And I think they tend to be a little more conservative. And so I think they're fine, you know, with running the ball a little bit more and trying to play tighter games. As you mentioned, the way that defenses are approaching offenses now, uh, it makes it, uh, you know, a little more advantageous to run the ball than it was five or 10 years ago. And then I'd also say, yeah, the quarterback play, like we've had a number of really good quarterbacks leave the league in the past five to 10 years. And it feels like, especially since that class with Trevor Lawrence, um, it just, it hasn't been that, that exodus of quarterback talent hasn't been replenished. It hasn't been replaced. And so we have fewer top tier passers in the league now. And 
uh, yeah, it's just the kind of situation to where I think more teams are quote unquote comfortable playing to try not to lose versus playing to try to win and to be aggressive with the downfield passing attack. So it's been uh, a very different style of football than what we've grown accustomed to in the past, you know, let's say since like 2006, when I think that was the first Drew Brees year with the Saints and where things really started to change for the league. It has been very different this year than what we've seen with the the ooh, almost knocked over the T than what we've seen with the trend of the past 15 years. We, we really didn't know how good we had it. I mean, growing up for me, that was you had Peyton Manning and Tom Brady battling out, and that would always be the primetime game every season. You had Drew Brees. You had all of these amazing guys. I mean, we had a draft class with Ben Roethlisberger, Eli Manning, and Philip Rivers in it. And yeah. all three of those guys have just wildly different Hall of Fame resumes. And, of course, a lot more ga- a lot more debate there, but it's just We've lost a lot of that. Yeah, and a couple more things. Like I would say, like the the quarterback hungriness of the league can kind of be reflected by the fact that we have seen a lot of quarterbacks go in the first round in the past four years, and in many of these cases, it felt like the league was reaching. You know, like Trey Lance, who had almost no college resume to speak of, going as the number three overall pick. Um, you know, Mac Jones, who like he obviously he had success at Alabama, but didn't have a long resume of success. And as someone who like people would talk about as being physically limited, him going in the first round this past year, six quarterbacks going in the top 12, when a number of those guys you could identify as like reaches, you could just say, based on what we historically see out of first round quarterbacks, these guys do not measure up. Uh, yeah. And so I think we see that. And then also kickers. Like, I know this sounds really weird, but like it is now not uncommon for guys to be able to drill field goals from 50 yards plus. And, and with that being the case, and with the fact that like teams are able to start five yards closer than they were in previous seasons because of the kickoff rules, coaches now have a little more incentive to try to play like a little more conservatively. Let's not turn the ball over. And if we get within range, we have a good chance of getting three points. Uh, And so I, I think because kickers are now able to help teams convert drives into points at a a more efficient rate, um, coaches might have that in mind and are just like a little more willing to be conservative. Was it Denny Carter who was someone on Twitter had a great point where they said, Football has been optimized now. And for that reason, it now sucks because once you optimize something, you take the fun away from it. And I feel like we're hit. It's, it's, it's sad, but true, especially with kickers, not named Justin Tucker. They're now automatic over 50 yards. And I think that the NFL is going to be having a long and hard look at some of the rules that they've implemented over the last couple of years and saying, okay, maybe we've had the wrong effect from what we were looking for here, but maybe, Maybe it's cyclical. It's cyclical. Yeah. It'll, it'll come back at some point. It, it, there's always like a wax and a wane. Yeah. And w- what I'm really interested in, and again, probably a topic for another podcast here, but I- I'm really interested in what's going to happen if we get to the point with the two high safeties and not stacking these boxes where you actually start hitting a consistent EPA efficiency, where it makes more sense to run first and pass second, because that could have so many impacts that we see across so many different stats, prop betting, main lines, that could, I mean, you're completely changing the game and reverting back to an early 2000s style of football then. Yeah, I mean, it'll be interesting to see what happens. Um, yeah, especially with running backs being more committee-based at this point. So, like, I'm thinking of this from the fantasy football perspective. Maybe it means we eventually have more running backs who are usable again if teams are just running the ball more. Um, but, yeah, we'll just we'll have to wait and see. It's, and the thing is, like, I feel like we've had a lot of really good wide receivers enter the league in the past five years. But if teams aren't passing as much, it kind of doesn't matter as much if you have a lot of good wide receivers. And the league has really invested more in wide receivers recently than in running backs. But like if you're paying some of these guys $30 million and then you're not really using them the way that you thought you would based on the compensation, then that also creates a really interesting scenario. So yeah, a lot of ways to think about how what is happening on the field is going to have ramifications uh, off the field. Yeah. And that's not even getting into what quarterbacks take up in the salary cap now, but again, 
different topic for a different podcast because we've now had two weeks of the NFL. And what that means, and Jack will definitely back me up on this, we know everything that there is to know about the league and what's going to be going on this season, how teams are going to use everybody. We Two weeks sample size, we're good to go now. No more overreactions. We can firmly make these predictions. And the first thing that I want to ask you here. Have you had any team that you've significantly moved up or down in your power rankings to the point where it's really standing out for you th for, through two weeks? Is there anyone that you're starting to say, okay, maybe we really misread the market on these guys? The Saints come to mind, but also who they've played so far. Yeah. Well, they did play my Cowboys, but maybe to your point, who have they played so far? But I, I will say, yeah, a couple of things come to mind. One, Tom, uh, you're wrong. Two, two data points is not enough. It's three data points. Once Got we it. have three weeks, then we know a hundred percent what's happening. Um, but yes, the teams that I have moved up the most since I did uh, their preseason power ratings, the Buccaneers, the saints and the Vikings. And all of those, I would say were teams that I had in the like bottom 10, bottom 12 of the league. Um, the Buccaneers, some of that is a function of who they played, you know, the, the commanders in week one, but I thought they looked really good against the lions uh, last week. Now that was a game they could have lost, but I've been impressed by what we've seen out of Baker May Mayfield so far. Like it doesn't seem like the absence of Dave Canales is something that's really going to derail that offense. And uh, the defense is, you know, kind of pretty much looking like itself. The Saints, I have no idea what to say. You know, like, yeah, you do it against the Panthers in week one, and I'm really not going to respect it. You do it against the Cowboys on the road when you're underdogs of almost a touchdown. Yeah, I got to respect it a lot more. And there's something with, like, the the Clint Kubiak, I mean, I don't want to say, like, the, the voodoo magic that he's bringing to this, but it's like, I didn't really respect what he was doing years ago as the Vikings offensive coordinator, and then he spent some time with Shanahan, and all of a sudden, like what he's doing feels Shanahan-esque. Uh, it's like he's revitalized the career of Derek Carr. Um, I mean, there were major concerns about whether Carr would actually finish the season uh, as the starter for the Saints. And now he has, you know, like one of the highest efficiency marks that we've ever seen through two weeks. Uh, granted, it is just two weeks, but you have to be impressed with what they've done. That offensive line, which was a big question mark entering the season, uh, I mean, they look very coalesced at this point. And that is kind of like a, a hallmark of the Shanahan scheme. Uh, think about like the guys that they have with the 49ers. They have one really good offensive lineman with the 49ers and then four guys who are like maybe like mediocre at best. But that whole line plays at a level that is much higher than the individual talent levels of the guys in that system. I, it feels like through two weeks, we've had something really similar to that with the Saints. And then with the Vikings, I mean, Sam Darnold. It's basically like all that needs to be said. Like Sam Darnold has played like a very competent NFL quarterback. And as long as that is the case... The uh, the Vikings will probably be a league average ish kind of team. I did not have them power rated that way when the season started. I had them as minus three on a neutral. Uh, so now they are much closer to being a, an average team and just in terms of how I'm evaluating them. The Sam Donald truthers. We are rising up and finally having our vindication. I've waited so long for this moment. I told I told you he's a good quarterback. The Jets and Panthers did him no favors, as you can see by Baker, too, is another one of those guys. I mean, they were the one and two in that draft class instead of the Jameis Mariota draft class where the answer was, eh, yeah, this answer looking like it could be like, damn, they were actually two good picks who just got shafted by their original teams. You know what? You have to think the the Browns wish they had Baker Mayfield right now. Oh, absolutely. Like, yeah. Like they wish they had a quarterback that competent. Yep. And everything about that trade, again, podcast for another day, because yes. you can go a full half hour just on the ramifications and impacts all across the way from that trade for the Browns. It was, it's just absolutely horrible for them and nobody feels bad. Nobody Absolutely. feels bad about it. That's going to end up being like a, a TV mini series at some yeah. point that like HBO does or something like that to where it's like the Deshaun Watson saga. That there are going to be clips from like the um the front office like deciding to make trades. Uh, of course, like everything that went down with Watson holding out and then like, I, I mean, just all of it in Houston. Yeah. And then like the the aftermath of it, that is going to be a TV series. Yeah. I mean, people like to say that the movie Draft Day is unrealistic because of the trades the GM makes. I argue that's a total like he is the Browns GM. That movie is actually really realistic here. That's good. <laughs> but 
So those are the teams that we've been moving up the board. How about some teams that we really do have to start taking a look at and say, okay, hang on a second. What's going on here? The Rams are the first one that's popping off here. Puka yes. Nakua week one, Cooper Cup week two, and the entire offensive. I think the three of us are playing O-line for the, Brown, uh, for the Rams this week. Uh, I mean, hopefully not. I, I like to think of myself as more of a backup kicker, but uh, if I had to play offensive line, I guess I could do it because the Rams certainly need some bodies. The The Rams are the team that I've moved the most down the power ratings. And I would say like that's separate from injuries, like separate from like a quarterback is injured because like that's something that's different in, in my process. Like just in terms of what they have exhibited on the field and trying to remove the impact of injury. Now that's like, pretty hard to do, but so like trying to do that to remove the impact of injury, the Rams have not really looked like themselves, quote unquote themselves for the past couple of weeks, uh, especially this past week. And I will say like, I was on the Rams. I've been on the Rams the past two weeks and uh, I have not been pleased with, with what I've seen, especially last week. I thought that McVay would be able to game plan with like enough time in advance uh, and just given how sharp he is, he would be able to game plan around the offensive line inefficiencies uh, that he had, or sorry, insufficiencies rather, uh, especially going against a Cardinals defense that I believed and kind of still believe a little bit is one of the worst in the league. Um, and so the fact that he wasn't able to do that, uh, especially since it's a team in his division, a team he knows really well, that is really concerning. And then you add all of the injury issues on top of that. As you mentioned, Puka Nakua on IR, Cooper Cup dealing with, I believe it's a, an ankle, potential high ankle injury. So I They're mean, saying it, he's going to IR too now. Yeah, so exactly. Being without those two guys, the offensive line issues. Now you're getting back your left tackle, your starting left tackle, uh, Alaric Jackson, who is suspended. So at least you're starting to get some more bodies on the offensive line, but you're still down two guys, uh, you know, on the offensive line. So it's it's not a good situation, uh, especially because you're missing your top two receivers, and they really were like the engine of the offense. So even setting aside those injuries, I think the Rams would be the team that uh, I've downgraded the most. But then you put all of the injury issues on top of that, and then that is incredibly significant. That said, I'm a sicko. Of course, for week three, I already have a ticket on the Rams at plus uh, – seven and a half going against the 49ers. I just, I can't help it. Oh God. So a good question here on those injuries uh, on our show last week, we we're talking uh, overreactions. And I had mentioned that uh, the bears had a couple wide receivers out and uh, you know, that it, it wasn't a big impact, but after the show, I started thinking about the effect of cluster injuries. And uh, that's a very real thing with the NFL is maybe one man doesn't stop the show, but one man plus his counterpart on the other side of, of the line or, uh, you know, his backup. And we, this is a case here with the Rams where we have cluster injuries. We have injuries to very real parts of their team. And it seems to be affecting them uh, greatly in terms of the effect on the spread. Matt, how how much weight do you put into cluster injuries and then also have you seen it like this where it is like gaping holes in the offensive line plus gaping holes in the wide receiver? This is a great question. And so uh, in my, and this is like very much, um, I'm trying to think of the right way of phrasing this. I like, I haven't done a lot of back testing on this. I have had like sort of informed conversations with people who are like the math nerds who know more than I do. And so like, I do know that there's a, a cumulative and a compounding effect from the cluster injuries. And so like in my projections, I have built in a system where, you know, if one guy is out, you are minus just the value that he adds. If two guys are out, you're minus their value plus a little bit extra. And then as each guy in that group is removed, the, uh, the value that you are minus, uh, grows in like compounds. It's not just sort of like additive it's multiplicative uh and i think that is the the right way to do it and so you see stuff like this pop up normally it's not at the beginning of the season that's the thing and then i will also say there's the possibility where with some uh with some teams maybe based on how they scheme 
what we would normally expect to see, the impact we would normally expect to see from cluster injuries doesn't manifest itself or doesn't manifest itself um, in the degree that we would expect. So for instance, I'm thinking of the Texans last year who early in the season had a world of offensive line injury issues. Like they were at one point, like on their fourth center, you know, like backup offensive guards, things like that. Um, But for some reason, they were able to work around all of that throughout the season. And some of that makes me think again of like the Shanahan offensive scheme, Bobby Slowick coming from the 49ers. It seems like for some reason that scheme is able to navigate better offensive line issues than some other schemes are. Uh, the, the Rams not really in that lineage. And so, you know, I think I would expect to see, uh, you know, an impact from the offensive line. And so I do take the cluster injuries into account and that's for all of the position groups, secondary, you know, if it's cornerback, if you're thinking secondary in general, defensive line, all of it, the one area where I think it doesn't matter quite as much as like, like, like off ball linebacker, <laughs> but like, I think those guys don't really matter that much in general. And the same with like running back. I think cluster injuries really don't matter all that much there, unless you're like on your fourth string guy and he's being signed off of the street, but cluster injuries do matter, except for like, I'd say like the positions where like those positions just don't tend to have much of an impact in general. And then if there are schemes where certain positions don't matter as much as you would kind of expect across the league. Now, how about when it comes to one specific position in the quarterback here? Because that's the next team that we have to talk about, and that is the Miami Dolphins. Uh, obviously, prayers up to Tua. Hope he recovers and is feeling better from his uh, concussion issues. But, you know, there's already talk of him possibly hanging him up for good. I would certainly not blame him for doing so. But in the meantime, they have Skylar Thompson. They might sign Ryan Tannehill. We don't know that. That's just what everyone thinks is the most logical thing to happen. That line went from uh, two and a half to five and a half the other way. It was Dolphins minus two and a half. Now it is Seahawks minus five and a half. Went all the way up to six. How much is Tua to Skyler worth on the point spread? And can they still compete given the weapons that the Dolphins do have? So this is a a really good question. And it touches on what you guys talked about previously with the drop from Jordan Love to Malik Willis. Uh, I had that last week as 6.25 points. Uh, And obviously that was not uh, in line with how the market moved. And I have the drop off from Tua to Skylar Thompson as a little under five and a half points. And again, that is not in line with how far the market has moved. And I think if you look at a lot of the quarterback injury line movements that we have seen in the past year or two, because there have been a, a number, especially last year, there were a number of backup quarterbacks who saw action yeah. in many of those circumstances. I think the line moved about a point to a point and a half too far uh, past like what I would have and, you know, other, other systems that I looked at kind of past what they had. And so I think this move that we've seen with the dolphins is in line with what we have seen the market do in recent memory when we've had a starting quarterback go out and a a new quarterback come in. Jack, how about you? Do you think that this one is probably about right? Or do you think that this is a, this is a line that may be moved to bridge too far there? And does the buyback on six indicate that? Yeah, it moved through a lot of dead numbers. So I'm okay with this one being a little further than we saw with, uh, with uh, uh, Willis last week. Um, this one does feel about right. I, th- I felt like the six was going to be the resistance point. It appears to be right now. Wouldn't wouldn't be surprised if we hit six again sometime this week, though. Now, how about the team that we did talk about there, the Packers? Malik Willis threw one game. Uh, it looked like maybe we overvalued a little bit. It's not like he lit the world on fire. I still didn't hit his passing over, and I felt dumb for placing that bet to begin with. But uh, they they went out. And they took care of business and won the game, and now they get to play a Titans team that I'm not sure Will Levis knows which team he's playing on uh, with the amount of turnovers that this man has at this point. And they're getting two and a half. You can even Caesars has a juice three. Uh, what do you think here, Matt? Is this something that the Packers can scheme around Malik Willis's inability to complete the forward pass? Or does, do the holes eventually start showing up? I was impressed with what we saw last week, especially given that, Malik Willis. So one, given what we saw out of him earlier in his career, 
with the Titans, by the way, in a hashtag revenge game. Not that that matters, but you know, whatever, just, it's nice to mention, but I was impressed with what we saw given that he was traded to this team in the preseason. And so it's not as if he's had a world of time to, to know the playbook. And the thing is, it's not as if like the offensive scheme that you would build around Jordan love immediately transfers to Malik Willis. Like you have to have a very different type of game plan with Malik Willis. And I was impressed by how quickly they were able to turn around and get an offense in place for Willis. Now, some of this is like, hey, they were going against a Colts defense that could be vulnerable on the ground. So maybe a little bit of luck just in terms of like what you need to do with a Malik Willis offense lines up really well with the opponent you had last week. But I don't have much respect for the Titans. And I have a lot of respect for Matt LaFleur and what he's been able to do with the the Packers and his tenure there. I think that uh, this is too far. Uh, I I already have a bet and I will say I'm terrible at reading markets. I just like, I know this about myself. Uh, I, I bet this too early. Like I bet on the money line, the Packers at plus 120. And, you know, now you're looking across the board at Bookmaker. I'm looking at the unabated odds page that you guys have there. At Bookmaker, it's plus 140, circa plus 131. So I, I bet this too early, but uh, I think this should be much closer to a pick em than what we see in the market right now. But at the same time, that's just my perspective on this. And like, can I see a world in which uh, Will Levis some point doesn't make the mind numbing interception doesn't, you know, turn the ball over and the, uh, the Titans are able to win at home against uh, a quarterback that they know really well. Yeah. Like that, that could happen too, but I don't have enough respect for the Titans to think that they should be favored by this much. I will say Brian Callahan. It's not just that he is a first time head coach. He is learning two jobs right now. He is a first-time head coach, and he is a first-time NFL play caller because when he was the offensive coordinator for the Bengals, he was not calling his own plays. So I I feel like he is still at a disadvantage in terms of being able to run the organization the way that you would want a head coach to be able to to do it. Uh, And so this is not anything against him like long-term, but right now I do think that the Titans are at a significant coaching advantage. And I, I don't think that a lot of people kind of appreciate like how much Brian Callahan is trying to scale up at this moment in his career. Yeah, it it's very difficult, and you do it, it's the kind of things that you don't think about. But believe it or not, coaching an NFL team pretty hard work, and calling the plays on top of that is just plain brutal. Yeah, they like you see it even with the uh, with the fact that they really just need to hire a teenager who plays enough Madden to manage their clock. Because how, how is it that NFL coaches do not manage the clock well in the year twenty twenty four? Explain it to me. I I can't. Okay. It's it's inexplicable. Uh, I have a list of unserious head coaches or at least like unserious head coaching decisions. And, uh, you know, any, every week I will sort of update my list based on the stupid stuff that head coaches do. And anytime I make a bet on a team, I try to remind myself to look at that list so that I at least remind myself, you know what? Like I am putting my money in the hands of Mike McCarthy, who will do some very unserious, stupid things throughout the season. And I just have to make myself say, I'm okay with that. I think there's enough of an edge here, or I need to say, you know what? There's not enough of an edge here to be investing in a guy who makes suboptimal decisions pretty regularly. But yeah, like eventually if you keep that list long enough and update it throughout the season, there are like 28 unserious head coaches in the NFL. And top of the ranking has got to be Sean Payton at this point. Like, I- I'm sorry. What on earth were the Denver Broncos doing out there. The amount of just insane punts, insane fourth down decisions. They actually went for it on a fourth down when they needed two scores. They go for it on a fourth down from like the opposing 40. And then the next series, because they get it, then the next series kick the field goal. You still need like you, you need a three and out no matter what, what on earth are you doing? And then they kicked it long. Okay. Okay. It's, Enough on the Bronx. Yeah. It's real. It's real. I'm Keith Hernandez type of energy. Yeah. And it's also the kind of thing to where like, there are certain types of head coaches that like, they just, I think they get to a certain age and it's just like, they know, they feel yep. like they know. 
They know everything that there is to know. And, and in all fairness, they probably do know almost everything there is to know about like schemes or different things like that. But that is completely different from clock management and game theory. Mm -hmm. And they don't know that. Uh, and so like, I feel like there needs to be a, a reevaluation of the, the things that are prized by general managers when they are looking to hire head coaches, because you don't necessarily need a head coach who can scheme up things. Maybe you do, maybe you don't, but you certainly need one person in the building who has a very strong sense of here is like strategically when we are going to be aggressive and here are the ways in which tactically we are going to be aggressive. And I feel like there's not enough of a focus on that in NFL coaching staffs. And part of that is just because those guys aren't trained to think that way. They're trained to think more in terms of X's and O's versus game theory. And then whenever you do have someone who's brought into the team to, uh, to kind of speak to those bigger picture strategic things, that tends to be an analytics person who's a little bit more of a nerd and not a football person. And so I think it's harder for the coaching staff to kind of get on the same page with that person because they think, Hey, you didn't play ball at the level that I did, or you don't know X's and O's to the degree that I do. So your opinion on this doesn't really matter. And then you've also got the extra layer, the last layer on top of it. And there's a book called Soccernomics that actually has a great chapter on this, even though it's talking about the other football, but it's the fact that you aren't penalized for going with the flow. If you, if you make yes. the fourth down decision, and even if it's the right fourth down decision, but then you don't, it doesn't work out your way. It's a lot more of a negative on you as the coach than just taking the safe option that every other coach in the league is going to take. Should it be that way? No, but that is absolutely something that these coaches think about when they're doing these. Yeah. I would love to have a, a situation where a coach before he's hired, like really outlines, Hey, this is where we're going to be aggressive. And like, I mean, you can't build this into a contract, but I almost would love if it's like, Hey, let's build into my contract that like I get a bonus every time we go for it on fourth down in these situations, like every, like every time, like on the, the, uh, the Ben Baldwin bot, it says that we should go for fourth down and I go for it. I get 5,000 extra dollars, like reward me for doing the intelligent things that might end up costing me my job because of how football fans react to this. But like, let's understand that as a team, we should be incentivized to be taking risk, like intelligent risk, especially when other teams aren't taking these risks. We, I felt like we were getting so close to it with Dan Campbell, and then he went for it on that fourth down after a penalty last year on the two point conversion. Where it was yeah. like, okay, okay, you, 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 you're gone. You've gone too far, Dan. But still, he's been the poster child for like taking more of those risks. But one more team that we do have to talk about before we get out of here uh, is the Panthers. News came out today, in incredibly quick benching of Bryce Young here for Andy Dalton, uh, 18 games into his career. Daniel Jones is on game 65, still playing for the Giants. But here we have Bryce Young probably done with the Panthers here. But uh, what do you make of this team? The line did move down. There were six point dogs, six and a half in some places versus the Raiders this week. And now it's down to five, five and a half. And the total jumped up three points. I don't know if it's moved enough. Now it did move, uh, you know, key a key number of six ish. Like that's, that's a little bit key, but um, I don't know if it's moved enough. I have Dalton as 3.1 points better than Bryce young. I mean, Dalton is like a, a perfectly average NFL quarterback and Bryce young has proven himself at least like in the current surroundings, coaching staff, whatever it is, he's proven that like at this point, he's not up to the level of where an NFL franchise would want its starting quarterback to be. So uh, I think it's a significant upgrade. And I will say this is a little bit sad for me because I did have like potentially like the survivor strategy of like, Hey, do I just take the team that's going against the Panthers every week and see how yeah. far this takes me? Uh, and so now we no longer have that, that Trump card in our hand, but yeah, I think for the, the Panthers, this is certainly, it's an interesting move because it helps them at least become conceivably more competitive in the short term. I don't know if it actually helps them in the long term. Like, I feel like you probably go, this is just my feeling of it. I think you probably go with Bryce Young and really give him the chance to develop, like give him the chance to become someone who can swim the ocean 
or just let the young man drown. And if that happens, maybe you end up with the number one pick once again. But what might happen is if you have Andy Dalton out there, you might actually win some games. Yeah. And like, sure, that's conceivably nice now, but that's not going to help you move on from Bryce Young. So I would just say like you invested, like you more than invested in Bryce Young. You invested last year's number one pick and you invested literally this year's number one pick in Bryce Young. Just stick with it and see if he can actually turn into an NFL quarterback with Dave Canales, who helped revitalize Geno Smith's career with the Seahawks, who helped revitalize Baker Mayfield's career with, with the Buccaneers. See if he can do something similar with Bryce Young. Two games is not enough. Yeah. Like, if and I will just say I'm extremely skeptical that Bryce Young turns into an actual NFL quarterback, but at least give him a longer runway because that would be good for him and good for the franchise if it works out. And if it doesn't work out, you at least lose more games, and that helps you get closer to replacing Bryce Young with a better draft pick. Andy Dalton, he's a better player for now, but he's just going to hurt you in the long term. Exactly. Like it, 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 if you're the Panthers this season, it does not behoove you to win football games. Yeah. And if you're going to tank, you might as well have an ultimate tank commander in charge. And Andy Dalton isn't going to be that guy for you. And Bryce Young, like it's the double whammy. You get to develop him and see if he can do anything. And instead, now you know what's going to happen. He's going to get chipped off somewhere else. And who knows? Maybe with an actual, maybe with actual talent around him, he can be something. But he's going to need limb lengthening surgery before he can get there to get him up to a height of like six, three or something. That dude's my height out there throwing footballs, man. It's ridiculous. But he, man, might even, he might even be your size. Uh, and, and by the way, I will say thinking about the, the Panthers, this is just one last thing. And I feel like this is sort of like a, um, a kind of unabated perspective. Like what I, I love about the site. Um, and specifically I'd say like, like Jack's perspective of like Jack, not being like a, like a hardcore, like football guy, but being someone who like, like knows markets really well and can think about kind of like arbitrage type of situations. And like, okay, if we see this number in this market, that means there's value in this other market that's correlated over here entering the season. I thought with the Panthers that there was value on this team, like, like a, a wide open division and they were plus 700 plus 750 to win their division or to make the playoffs. And then I looked over in the correlated market of coach of the year Dave Canales was 20 to one. And it was like, okay, if this team goes from winning two games to actually making the playoffs, you know, winning nine or 10 games, that's the kind of thing that strongly correlates to a guy getting coach of the year. So I had really high, not even high expectations, but high hopes for this team that they would be able to develop Bryce Young based on the new coaching staff coming in, the rebuilt offensive line, uh, the new pass catchers that were coming in. I had hopes that this would be a team that would be able to develop. And I was just, it's not like I was counting that 20 to one ticket, but I was just like, pleased. I was tickled with the idea of like, oh man, I maybe just gamed this market. Uh, and then of course, no, we've seen through two weeks, not at all. That's going to be the case. But I feel like the Panthers, it's like, that's a process bet. And this was like one of the opportunities this year that I was like pleased with the way I was able to look at different markets and think about what is the optimal way to attack this team in the market with the thesis of things get better. Right. And uh, I feel like that perspective is like an unabated type of perspective. And I feel like I've gotten more into that mindset based on listening to to your shows, reading the material on your website, uh, you know, like hearing Rufus talk, all of that stuff. So I, I, I feel like it's just like it didn't work out in this instance, but that's just that's part of the process. It doesn't work out most of the time. You take your shots, you, you have your strategic ideas. And when it does hit, it hits in a way that, you know, covers everything. But that was one of the bets that I really liked this year. And I felt even as I was doing this, I was thinking like this feels like an unabated type of move. I Solving the logic puzzle. I love it. Yep. Well, Matt, we absolutely love that, even though that one didn't work out. But hey, uh, now it's, I mean, let's face it, Coach of the Year is now Sean McVay's to lose. If he gets that team to the playoffs, just lock it in. He's got that. But um, it has been awesome having you on the show again. We need to have you back a lot more often. Thank you so much for giving us the time today. We've got Monday Night Football going off in a few minutes here, and I know that you've got to get back to finishing up your power rankings and your articles for the week here. But Thank you so much for being with us here. If people want to catch you and all the awesome work you're doing, where can they head? 
Yeah, you can uh, follow me on social at Matt F the Oracle. Although I'll just be honest, I don't I don't post a ton of stuff on there. And if I do, sometimes it's about music and not necessarily about football. But all of my work you can find at Fantasy Life. We've got the Betting Life newsletter that comes out seven days a week. I think there's some great content in there, and it's even better now that I don't have to write it. So a win for everybody. Uh, and then I've got my uh, fantasy article that comes out on Wednesdays, my best bets article that comes out on Thursdays, and then a prop article that comes out on Fridays. And you can find all of my rankings and player projections uh, on Fantasy Life. And he, once again, is Matt Friedman from over at Fantasy Life. Thank you so much for joining us. And thank you so much for tuning into the episode, ladies and gentlemen. You know the drill. Like, subscribe, and share. Make sure that you're leaving us that rating. If you do, screenshot it to me. Get yourself a free T-shirt potentially here. I'll be sending a couple of those out. Thank you again so much for being here with us. Best of luck, everybody. And let's cash some tickets. We'll see you next week.